Shalom, shalom, and greetings, my friends and family. What's up, my people? And welcome, or welcome back, to Bible on a Bicycle. My name is Will, and I'm an aspirant follower of Yeshua HaMashiach. You might know him as Jesus Christ. And in this here little series of videos, we've been featuring the teachings of the late great Brad D. Scott from Wild Branch Ministries. You can find out more information about Brad and his ministry in the links down below this video. In the previous video, Brad discussed the foundations of the Hebrew language and his unique agricultural slant on the scriptures. Now, I don't agree with everything that Brad says 100% across the board, but it's seldom that we can find individuals that we agree with 100% across the board. That being said, Brad and his teachings proved to be an invaluable resource in my early walk with Yeshua as far as it comes to the Hebrew language itself and getting a better understanding of the ancient Hebrew culture and its language. And besides that, I just like the way the guy teaches with gentleness, humor, and sincerity. In this here little video, part one of the two of the teaching that Brad refers to as taking it back to the mountaintop. Shalom and welcome back to the last time uh, we met together. We were kind of, I was laying some of the foundation for where this beautiful language comes from. If you remember, every word in your Bible, once again, is found, the meaning is found in every uh, 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 agricultural thing that you see and our bodies and the natural things of creation where's where all the words are found. And we're going to give some examples of that as I take these words back to their mountain top meaning. Uh, mountain, back to the mountaintop meaning is just a word I phrase, uh, uh, coined, if you will, to express the idea of taking words back to where they first began. Now, for those of you who know and are familiar with the Hebrew language, virtually every word that I give you on these programs, I'm going to take it back to the call stem, third person masculine singular, perfect which is the simple stem in Hebrew. Now, for those of you who don't know Hebrew, which is probably almost everybody uh, that's watching this program, I'm going to take it back, the words back to what they meant when they first started in the beginning. And I call that the mountaintop meaning of the word. Now, let me give an example. Imagine for a moment that you are picturing a mountain, a series of mountain. I know this is hard for some of you in Kansas, but nonetheless, picture a mountain and picture the clouds gathering on the mountaintops and it's stormy and you see the lightning bolts and so forth. And when the rain first comes down out of the sky, the water is pure, it's pristine, it's oxygenated, and it's absolutely full of energy. And so when the words, I mean the rain, first comes down out of the, uh, out of the, out of the clouds on the mountaintop, it's actually good to drink. It's good to drink. But over time, as the words, I mean the rain, as the words start to come down the mountaintop and connect with other little tributaries and streams, now we have men human civilization dumping stuff into the river and taking stuff out. The fishermen come, not that there's anything wrong with fishermen. Don't let me get a bunch of fishermen emails, okay? But the fishermen come and fish the life out of the river and men are dumping stuff into the river. And by the time that river gets to a large body of water like the ocean, guess what? The water is brown, it's thick, it's dirty, it's yucky, if you will, and it's no good to drink anymore. And I submit to you all, all people over the centuries who believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we've all been drinking from the same river. It's just some of us have been drinking downstream where it dumps into the Gulf of Mexico, if you will. And I want to take you back to what these words meant when they first started on the mountaintop, when they were pure and pristine. So I want you to get that image in your mind as we go through these various words. Because once again, every word in your Bible, and words are kind of unseen. Theology and teaching are things you really can't see. And so God knew that we couldn't see them. Remember, we all agreed that God was smarter than we are. And so God already knew that we could not see what he really wants desperately to teach us. 
And so he revealed them in the things that we can see. And these things you're going to find are all in the beginning. So matter of fact, as you can see in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, Romans chapter 1, verse 20 says that the invisible things of him from the creation are clearly seen being understood by the things which are made. Now I'll read that again. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things which are made, even his eternal power in Godhead so that they are without excuse. See, man is without excuse. God has revealed all these things that we can't see in the things that are seen from the very beginning. That's how smart God is. Because, and not only smart, but he loves us. Because he's, he's Papa. Do you know the most imperative title of God is really not God? The most imperative, the most important characteristic of God is not really Yahweh or Jehovah or Adonai or El Shaddai and so forth. It's Papa. It's Abba. It's Father. Why is that the most imperative title? Because that's the one that most people on the planet can relate to is Papa. Sometimes we have trouble relating to an eternal judge. Sometimes we have trouble relating to even the concept of Yahweh and so forth. But almost everybody on the planet can relate to a Papa. And I'm going to suggest to you that's why it's so important that fathers, I'm speaking to you fathers right now, it's so important that as fathers we be godly, righteous men and fathers. Why? Because to most children, that's the image that they see of that father. Because, see, that father is unseen. And so he made it clear so we can understand in the things which are seen. So, Papas, you are the seen version of what we can't see. So that's why that's so important. Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take you through some examples of some words based upon this mountaintop meaning of the word. And what's going to happen is I'm going to give you some examples, and as these things appear on your screen in just a second here, what I want you to see is that the words on the left-hand side of your screen are the words as they are brown, dirty, and yucky, and dumping into the Gulf of Mexico, if you can get the little image in your mind. And by the take, time we take them across the screen to the right-hand side, you're going to see them now in their agricultural meaning. You're going to see what the definitions of these abstract words on your left are, and I'm going to further explain uh, abstract in a, in, a, in a future program. You're going to see what they mean when we take them back to the simplicity that was in the beginning. Man is the one who made a big stinking mess, big stinking complicated mess, out of something so simplistic in the very beginning. It's man that has done that, not God himself, or excuse me, not Papa, if you will, or Abba himself. Okay, so these are the mountaintop meanings of the word. Now, I have chosen words that are very familiar. Our first word is very familiar, apostle, apostle. Now, we all have talked about apostles, and we've all read about apostles. So we have arguments over apostles. Were there apostles for today? Is it just for them? Uh, is it something that went away with the, with the canon and so forth? And so we all argue about exactly who were apostles and, were, and who wasn't and how many are there, uh, are there. But what does the word apostle mean? Now, I say that, what does the word apostle mean? Because most of us study by looking up English words in what I call Americanized dictionaries. Now, what do I mean by that? Whether they be Hebrew or Greek, but Hebrew is the main language that I teach. We want to know what a word means. We grab a Strong's Concordance, and that's a good tool to start out with, but if you are left just with a Strong's Concordance, you are uh, uh, sadly not getting anywhere near the root of the word because that's not what a Strong's Concordance is good for. So you look it up in an Americanized Hebrew dictionary. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, the Brown Driver Briggs and Jacinius and, and Thayer's and Kittles and all those uh, Hebrew lexicons are Americanized Hebrew. In other words, by the time the Hebrew is filtered through the system and gets to you, it's been Americanized. It's been watered down. It's, it's been made abstract. But Hebrew will take it always into something that you're familiar with. Now look at this word apostle. Apostle, if you look it up in an Americanized dictionary, it will say something like to send out and so forth. But this is a Hebrew term. It's apostolos in the Greek, shalach in the Hebrew, 
And it means the shoots of a plant. The shoots of a plant. Now, just think logically here. The shoots of a plant. Why is that important? And let me, first of all, let me ask you, how many of you know that the etymological beginning, the agricultural picture, see, let me suggest something to you. There's a thing going on for the last 10 or 20 years called Hebrew roots. Some of you may be familiar with that. Do you know why we call it Hebrew roots? Roots, wink, wink, hint, hint, okay? Roots, because every word, when we take it back to what it meant in the beginning, is gonna come back to something that you can see growing right outside your window. We've made it abstract systematic theology. But from the beginning, it's been something growing in my garden right outside the door. It's something that I live with in myself every day. That's because God is a smart God. And so what's the significance of the word apostle being the shoots of a plant? Well, because according to the law of like kind, the laws given in the opening chapters of Genesis, all the natural and all the spiritual laws are given in the opening chapters of Genesis, if you know those first opening chapters. And so the idea is this. The shoots of a plant... If there's only one good seed from the beginning, according to Paul, according to Galatians chapter 3.16, we are Abraham's seed, not seeds of many, but one seed, and that is the Messiah. So according to the word of God, there's only one good seed. There's two seeds in the beginning, the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. But there's only one good seed. If there's only one good seed in the beginning, and that seed always multiplies after like kind. Remember, the first commandments given to man and plants and animals, go ye forth and multiply... So if that's true and there's only one good seed in the beginning, then we produce the same fruit in the end as all those people did in the beginning because we all, if we're believers, only have one seed. So we don't need to make this a theological argument. God has already re revealed it to us in the way apples work or tomatoes. See, the fruit of the shoots of an apple plant will be an apple. Okay? If there's only one good seed from the beginning, then the shoots that come off of that seed through that trunk and through the branches and through the flower and the fruit and so forth, the shoots that come out of it will be an apple. If you start out with an apple seed, then the shoots of a plant will be an apple. So in other words, the fruit or the message of the apostles, shoots of a plant, will be the same message as the seed. Now I want you to get that image in your mind. The same message or fruit of the shoots of the plant, i.e. apostles, will be the same fruit that's in the seed. And how long has the seed been around according to the scriptures? In the beginning, because the seed was the word of God. Luke chapter 8, verse 11, the seed is the word of God. And John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and God was the word, and took upon flesh and dwelt among us. So how long has the seed of the word been around? From the very beginning. Not in the middle, but from the very beginning. So it's important to see these agricultural pictures because they help make clear the theology. I submit to you that this Bible right here, called the Book of Life, this Bible called the Book of Life is the source of everything that we believe and everything that we do. And if we really, 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 really believe that this is the Book of Life, then we ought to know more about this. We ought to know it upside down, backwards and forwards. We ought to be falling all over ourselves to know what this book says. We ought to know more about this book than we do the life of Michael Jackson or whether Paris Hilton's going to spend another night in jail or not. Or the plot of CSI Miami, okay? But unfortunately, most of us don't know it. What's even sadder than that is that even though my motivation is to motivate some of you to fall in love with this beautiful language called Hebrew. I'm starting to preach now, I'm sorry. But even though my motivation is to get some of you to fall in love with this beautiful language because you'll see treasures like you've never seen before. And I want you to see this Hebrew language. The reality, according to George Barna, which is a very well-known Christian pollster, the reality that we face is that most Christians in America do not know what their Bible says in English, much less Hebrew. They don't even know what it says in English. That is the book of life. And that's the source of our nutri nutrition. And that is the bread. And that is the seed of the word of God. And it's been the same since the very beginning. Okay, let's stop, stop preaching now and let's get back to teaching a little bit. Okay, back to our, back to our uh, study now of the common examples. The next word that we have is grace. 
Very familiar term. I haven't chosen abstract words that nobody knows anything about. I've tried to choose the words that we all use all the time. Grace is an English word, but it's abstract. Once again, it's like apostle. By the way, before we go on, let me ask you a question. See the word apostle again? How many of you knew before this program that there are more apostles in the Old Testament than there are in the New Testament? Now, see, we haven't been trained that way. We haven't been programmed that way. See, we watch too much TV. Too much, too, too much TV. We watch too much TV. And that's why they call it network programming. Okay? It's because we get a lot of our understanding of theology from the you know, Ten Commandments and sitcoms and so forth. But nonetheless, we have been trained that we take the English word apostle, we look it up in our trusty Strong's Concordance, and we don't see the English word apostle in the Old Testament, so we conclude there are no apostles in the Old Testament, that that's a New Testament teaching. But remember, there's nothing new in the New Testament. It's just true. That Greek word apostolos and all of its cognates shows up much more in the Old Testament than it does in the New Testament. You read the Old Testament in Greek, we call that the Septuagint, you'll see this concept much more in the Old Testament than you do in the New. And you want to know why? Because there's more books in the Old Testament than there are in the New. So it's only, only likely that we would show it, see it show up more times in the Old than we do in the New. Now let's get back to grace. Grace is an abstract term. It means different things to different people. In the Greek, that is charis. Charis in the Greek. It is chana, chana in the Hebrew. It means to pitch a tent. Its agricultural meaning and its biological meaning, if you will, is something that, that the Hebrew people did every day of their life. To pitch a tent is what the word means. And so it's a common thing that they did every day. It's not some thing that, that's hard to understand and hard to grasp. They pitch tents every day. And so in Hebrew thinking, you remember the people that wrote the Bible? Hebrew thinking? Why do, well, why do I say that? You might ask that. In the book of Philippians, Paul says, Let this mind be in you that was in the Messiah Yeshua. Let this mind be in you that was in the Messiah Yeshua. Now, how many of you know that the mind in the Messiah was not the mind of a Swedish Presbyterian? How many of you are familiar with the fact that Yeshua did not graduate from Dallas Theological Seminary and he didn't live in Wheaton, Illinois? He was a Hebrew. He thought like a Hebrew. He taught like a Hebrew. The Bible was written by Hebrews. And God knew as he reveals it to Paul, a Hebrew, surprise, surprise, as he revealed it to Paul that I can get you to behave like Yeshua if I can get you to think like Yeshua. And I think that is something that God is doing very quickly in these latter days, training us to think like the Messiah. Why? Because he ultimately wants us to behave like the Messiah. He wants us to do the things the Messiah did. That's why he said, think like he did. Because when the, the God of the universe took upon flesh and dwelt among us, Yeshua, he kept all the commandments that he wrote. He kept the Sabbath. He kept the feast. He kept the dietary laws. He wrote those commandments and he kept them. And then he turned to you and me and he said, take up your cross and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. What's so hard to understand about that? But we teach, uh, we teach almost the opposite of that. That's the way I was trained uh, when I was a Christian pastor. I almost taught the opposite of that. That because he did the things that were righteous and good and holy, now we don't have to do the things that are righteous and holy. Okay? That's the way I was taught, and probably some of you were taught that way as well. Okay, let's get back to grace. It means to pitch a tent. So every time they pitched a tent, in Hebrew thinking, they didn't pitch, you didn't pitch your tent with any old Tom, Dick, and Harry. Okay? In Hebrew thinking, there was no such concept of going to a KOA and just throwing your tent down the next to somebody else and having people in your tent. You didn't invite anybody in your tent. In Hebrew thinking, as a matter of fact, the Egyptians were more adamant about it than the Hebrews were. Okay? You didn't eat with a Jew. You didn't spit your tent, pitch your tent with a Jew and so forth. So it's a very serious thing. In Hebrew thinking, when you pitch a tent with somebody, your lives become their lives. Your things become their things. There's one head with one tent and everybody's under the same headship. That's the idea. Now, why is that important? Well, that's because of our next word. Our next word is faith. Faith, another very familiar term. Faith, pistis in the Greek, aman in the Hebrew. 
we take it back etymologically, back to the very concrete meanings in the beginning. It's to drive a stake to support a tent. It's also the Hebrew word for nursing. We're going to get into this word in much more detail in, in programs coming up here. But very quickly, it has to do with that tent. It's related, directly related to the concept of pitching a tent. Remember, these are common things that the Hebrew people did all the time. To drive a stake to support a tent. So when Paul says... For by grace are you saved through faith. When he says, for by grace are you saved through faith, in Ephesians chapter 2, and verse 8, he's drawing you a wonderful picture, a very familiar picture to the Hebrew people of what grace and faith are uh, when, because they were used to pitching a tent and securing that tent by driving it down uh, with a stake or a nail into the ground. Okay, our next word is law. Law. Now, there is an uncontroversial word, of course. Law. Law in our culture. What does the English abstract word law mean in our culture? Well, it's a very ugly word in our culture. I'll tell you that right now. When I was a kid growing up, 50s and 60s, one of the, one of, one of the most popular songs was, I fought the law and the law won. I fought the law and the... See, the concept of the law chasing you. You're driving down the road and you're speeding and here come the blue lights and every fear is stricken in people. Oh my goodness, the law. The law is coming after me. The law. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get arrested by the law and so forth. So it's a very negative term in our culture. But in the scriptures, as we take it back to its mountaintop meaning, it's a beautiful word. Now, it comes from the Greek word. We get the English word law from the Greek word namas, N-O-M-O-S, namas. But namas in the Greek does not equal Torah in the Hebrew. That's just the closest word that the Greek language has to express or translate the Hebrew word Torah. So they chose the closest word. Namas in Greek can mean any law. It can mean the Torah. It can be referring to the Torah. And it can refer to Greek law or Roman law or natural law or stupid law. Pharisaical law, Sadducitical law, scribal law. But see, we've been trained in our religious culture that when we read the word law in the, in the New Testament, it's only referring to God's commandments. The Torah. No, it is not. I submit to you less than a third of the time that you see the English word law in your New Testament is it talking about the Torah. Most of the time it's talking about the laws of the Pharisees and the Sadducees which were yokes on the Gentiles, which were also yokes on the fathers, Acts chapter 15. The fathers could not bear those things either. And that's why the warning, if we could not expect our fathers... Uh, to be able to uh, obey all these things you've added and taken away from it. Why are you asking the Gentiles to do that if our own fathers couldn't bear that kind of yoke? We're not talking about the Torah because the Torah is righteous and holy. Now, back to the word law again. As you can see, we have law on the left. Then we have namas in the Greek. Now we have yara, Torah, and Torah comes from the root yara, Y-A-R-A-H, yod resh he. And yod resh hay is an agricultural term, surprise, surprise. It means to cast forth, particularly rain. It's a picture of a fruit, or a flower, excuse me, casting forth fruit. And it's a picture of the sky casting forth rain. All right? Now, why is this such an important picture to grasp? Because God is teaching us, through agriculture, what he has for his own children. And so forth. So when you see the rain, remember that picture of the mountains I was talking about earlier. When you see the rain cast forth from the clouds and it comes down on our fields of our crops and it waters the field and crops and it causes the field and the fruit to produce abundantly so that we can live. And not only that, but it, it, it aids in the process of photosynthesis so we can all breathe even. So the purpose of the rain coming out of the clouds is to bless us. See, the Torah in the scripture is blesses you when you obey it, curses you when you do not. It's never been designed from the beginning to save you. The Torah is not designed to save you. The blood of the lamb saves you from day one. It's always been the blood of the sacrifice or the blood of the lamb that delivers man. 
The Torah was never designed to save you. And so if you use it for something it was not designed to do, you are cursed. That's why Paul calls it the curse of the law. Curse of the law is trying to use the law to save you. No, the law blesses you when you keep it and curses you when you don't. The blood of the lamb is the only thing. And I want to make that abundantly clear. But the picture of the Torah, Yara, is something cast forth from the heavens to bless us. And it's always been that way and it's never changed. So that's the beautiful picture when you see the rain coming out of the clouds. As a matter of fact, if you remember, Isaiah says, my word is like rain that comes from the heavens. It accomplishes what I set it about to do and it will not come back unto me void. And when he sets it out to what it accomplishes, what he sets it out to do, that means it will bless the things if you receive it, and if you don't receive the rain, it curses the field, okay? If the field doesn't receive it, only when the field receives the rain. And see, that's the main difference between the, uh, the, the creation and us, is that the creation receives it naturally. It's only people like us, human beings, that when God reveals his precious Torah to us, that we can choose to say, no, I don't want it. That's the major difference between a man and a daffodil, okay? Daffodils work God, worship God instinctively, and they worship Him and produce daffodils. Why? Because by nature they are daffodils. That's why they produce the flower and the fruit of a daffodil. An orange produces more oranges because it's an orange. But you and I, it doesn't have a choice, but you and I are given choice. So if we are a new creation in the Messiah, then we ought to be producing the fruit of God because before we were a new creation, we were producing our own fruit or the fruit of our religion or the fruit of our organization or the fruit of our own belief, whatever that may be. The most important principle in Scripture, once again, is the principle of the seed. Now, one last one very quickly. Inherit or heir or inheritance in the Bible, whether it be any one of those words, Kleronamas in the Greek, Nachal in the Hebrew, and it's a river or a stream. In Hebrew, the idea of inheritance is a river or a stream. If you don't know what that means, I suggest before we come back in our next session, you go out and find a river and drink downstream from a herd of cows, and you'll get a real graphic picture of what it means to inherit, okay? So I hope that we've given a few examples here. Next time we get back together, we're going to give some more examples of the mountaintop meaning of words, taking them from their uh, abstract meaning in our Western cultures, all Western cultures are like that, as we take it back to this beautiful language that your Bible was written in, this ancient Hebrew, these mountaintop meanings, uh, what they meant when the words first started in the very beginning. And so between now and then, I hope that you'll tune in next time as we uh, get into some more detail of this beautiful language. So in the meantime, cling to your roots that your days may be long and that you will prosper in everything you set your hand to do. In the meantime, Shalom Aleichem. Be blessed and we'll see you on the next program. Shalom. Well, hallelujah and praise the Lord. As always, I find Brad's teachings refreshing and informative. As I said, I don't always agree with Brad 100% when it comes to his theology, but I do believe he was a sincere man of God. As for myself, no, I'm not Jewish, nor am I part of any of the uh, Torah observant movement, or do I have any affiliations with any religious organizations whatsoever. But as an aspirant follower of Yeshua, who was both Jewish and Hebrew during the second temple period, I am very interested in learning as much as I can about the ancient Hebrew language and culture, because it's my opinion that the more we know about Yeshua and the way he thought in the culture and language that he spoke and lived in, the more we can discover about not only the scriptures, but this new covenant that us as believers find ourselves in. In short, I'm an aspirant follower of Yeshua, and part of following is obeying the commands, those commands that not only fulfilled but revealed the fullness of God's law. Not the law of the Pharisees or the Sadducees that became unbearable yokes and perversions of the Mosaic law. Because as we can read in the scriptures themselves, the Torah does not bring salvation, folks. 
The Torah brings blessings and curses. But let's be clear on one thing. It is Yeshua HaMashiach, the Messiah, that brings about salvation. But that's just where I stand on the matter. I'd be interested in what you had to say about this here teaching of Brad Scott's, the Torah, the Hebrew language. What do you think about all this? Down in them comments down below. You know the routine while you're going down that way. Why not hit that little subscribe button down there? Give us a little love next door with that thumbs up. And make sure you hit that there share button and share this here little video with any friends or family members that you think might enjoy or benefit from this here little teaching of Brad Scott. Big shout out to all you new subscribers and much love to all you returning subscribers. Hope to see you all here next time. And until next time, remember, Yeshua, Jesus loves you. And so do I. Now get off of here. Go bundle up because it's cold in these parts. And then go read your Bible. Okay.